praise the name of the Lord. God bless you so much this morning. I'd like to welcome you, take this time to welcome you to our sanctuary Sabbath service. This is Sunday Sermons with Pastor Anthony Lester. And we this morning we are we're excited to to go into detail and to announce that the victory and all the things that God has laid before us, anything that comes in your life, God has given a very clear, a powerful remedy and an object where we need to focus our attention on the things of God, on the things of God. So today what we want to do is we want to welcome you. We want to take this time to thank you for inviting us into your home. Thank you for the opportunity to share this time of fellowship with you. We are um, going to uh, go deeper into our sermon series where we are focusing on going through the book of Joshua. And today we are going to continue our, our exposition on the experience of Joshua and the children of Israel as they are preparing themselves to go into the conquest of possessing the promised land. With that being said, I'd like to ask if you would turn with me to the book of Joshua and chapter two. Joshua chapter two. And we're gonna look at we're gonna look at verse 12, start off in verse 12 and pick up where we left off on last week. Last week. Joshua chapter two, verses 12 through 22. 12 through 22. The Bible says, and therefore I pray, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token. Let's bow our hearts in a word of prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come in the name of Jesus through the blood of the lamb, the blood that was shed, O oh God, for the redemption of our sins and oh God to allow us to gain access as children of God. We thank you God because we know that we've been born again God and we've been redeemed oh Father by the blood of Jesus Christ. As we continue Lord or as we seek your face, as we are in pursuit of understanding through your word, we ask oh God that in all that we get that you would allow us to know how to appropriate the most powerful tool that you've given us, O oh God, and that is the blood of Jesus. That is the blood of Jesus. So God, we pray that you'll bless our time together. God, that you'll bless each heart, bless each mind. Open our eyes, O oh God, that we might understand your word. And we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory for it's in Jesus' name that we pray and for his name's sake. We ask this blessing. Let the people of God say amen. The people of God say amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are ready. We are ready. We find ourselves in at a point in our, in our lesson, in our series, in our Sunday services, in our Sunday morning sermons. We, we are at a point where we've got to really, really take our time to understand and to, and to put together a clear, a clear perspective as we focus on the things that God has set before us that will assure us victory, that will ensure us deliverance, that will ensure that no weapon that's formed against us will be able to prosper. But we say today that I am convinced that everything that goes on in our lives is, is, is designed to force us to consider and to shift our focus from the things that are going on to focusing on the one individual, the one thing, the one person who God has sent to make it so that we are more than conquerors. The Bible says we are more than conquerors through him. Today, we wanna to spend some time to focus on him, to focus on what we find in the scriptures as it pertains to him. We'd like to start off this morning by introducing a couple of verses and our theme, our sermon subject for today, our title of this message is Rahab's Redemption. We're gonna talk about the scarlet, the scarlet thread, the scarlet thread. 
And what we find is that theologians and Bible students, oftentimes, they refer to this, this idea of, of a scarlet thread right in the text that we're, that we're in. As we look at Joshua chapter 2, we're, we'll see the introduction of this theme, this, this, this thread. Chapter 2, verse 12 of Joshua. We start there. It says, now therefore I pray you. And Rahab the harlot is speaking. At this point in time, she has hid two spies that have crossed over the Jordan, come into the area and the vicinity of the city of Jericho. And when they were going to spy out Jericho, they ran into, they, they, they discovered and they entered into a harlot's house named Rahab. What we talked about last week is that Rahab demonstrated uh, one very major, major thing. One is she, 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 she showed and showed, she worked her faith and her faith was able to thwart or either it, it was able to muzzle out her fear. She operated in faith without fear, faith without fear. The king of Jericho discovered that these two spies had come into Rahab's house. He sent his soldiers or his people to go and to confront Rahab and to tell her to bring out the spies that we know that have come into your house. But instead of bringing them out without them knowing it, Rahab hid them on the rooftop of her house and covered them with thrash. She did that and it showed that she was putting God, giving God what we call the preeminence. When we give God the preeminence, it means that we give God the first position, the first ranking. We, we put him above. He is, he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And what Rahab does, she demonstrates to us that no matter what the threat, no matter what it was going to cost her and as it pertained to her life being in danger, she feared God more than she feared the king. And in that fear, she did two things. One, she denounced and did not deliver them over to those that the king said to give the spies to. She, she hid them on her roof. And the second thing she did is she lied. She lied and said that she don't know where they came from. She didn't know where they went, but that she did see them leave. You know, they left and she didn't know where they were. At that point in time, it leaves Rahab to where we really, really now need to dig a little deeper. When we pick it up in verse 12, what happens is that Rahab is talking to the two spies. She goes up on the roof before they lay down to go to sleep. She goes up, up on top of the roof and she confronts the two spies and enters into a major conversation, a historically life-changing conversation, not just for Rahab, but for Rahab and her family. But it wasn't just for Rahab, it was for her family and it was also for the whole entire world. This is a portion of scripture that God puts in that points us and leads us into one of the very major themes that we must always understand that is a thread that's found throughout the whole Bible. And by this, what we mean is that the Bible's theme is Jesus Christ. And the theme of the Bible is Jesus Christ and his sacrifice that he made for the redemption of mankind. Hence, we have our subject, redemption. The word redeem means to buy out. It means to pay a price, pay a price in exchange for ownership, to, to literally to, to give a ransom, to pay the ransom in, in, in order to set someone free that is a slave or a hostage. In this context, Rahab is literally a person that is living in Jericho and she is suffering so much in Jericho that she's rendered, she's resorted to prostitution just to take care of herself and her family. So Rahab is literally doing this occupation just to stay alive and to keep her family alive in the midst of the oppression and what they're being subject to underneath the king of Jericho. So as we move forward, we, we want to tap into the very object, the object of what is introduced in this text. It says 
she, listen to what it says in verse 13. Key words in verse 13. It stems from the first key word that we find at the end of verse 12. At the end of verse 12, it introduces verse 13. The word is, she says, I pray that you, that I, I showed you kindness. I hid you. And I'm asking that you would also show kindness to my father's house. One thing I love about Rahab is Rahab is not as concerned about herself. She's literally, she has her mind on, on, on her family, her father's house being saved. And she says, and I need a sign. I need a token. I need a sign of the fact that you will save my family. Look at verse 13. The key word that's introduced in verse 13, it says, and that you will save alive my family. God, God has allowed these two spies to come into Rahab's house for God to give all believers in God an object lesson that stems all the way from the beginning of the Bible and goes through to the book of Revelation. Key word she uses, she's, she's concerned about salvation that you will save my father, save alive, save alive. And that in other words, that they won't die. And my mother, I'll save alive my father, my mother, my brother, my sisters, and all that they have. And deliver, key, second key word, and deliver. So Rahab is concerned about two things that we can see in this text. She's concerned about salvation and she's concerned about deliverance. Deliverance means when you deliver somebody, that means you save them from death. You save them from a dangerous situation where they can't get themselves out of it. They need another force greater than the threatening force to get them and to set them free and deliver them because they can't deliver themselves. Oh, and the man, the man answered, here we go. It says, watch our life for yours, a life for your life. That means we're going to look. You gave us, you give us your life, I'll give you mine. This is starting to begin to be very, uh, very theological. It's actually beginning to be very, uh, the, the word is called uh, uh, soteriology. It's a big word that means this, like the study of salvation. It's starting to lay out the foundation of something that's bigger than all that's going on here. A life for yours. Jesus Christ came to lay down his life for many. He gave his life for many. He says, 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 and he says, if you utter not this our business, if you don't discuss this, if you don't let your light, right hand know what your left hand's doing, then it's gonna be. Watch this, it's gonna come to pass. These men say it's gonna come to pass. And they don't talk about what they're gonna do. They says, when the Lord gives us the land, when the Lord has given us the land, when God delivers the land over to us, God is going to also, God is saying, I am going to, look, the object of Joshua's mission is to take the land, but God's got salvation on his mind and demonstrates to everybody that whenever you're faced with a battle when you need to go into a situation where you need to conquer that which you can't conquer, where you need to go and face the enemy, where you need to really go into a situation where you're bound, where you can't get out or you can't get a breakthrough or you can't get deliverance. God is showing in this lesson with Rahab that the key to victory, that this is the victory that overcomes the world. All this is a picture of a Christian going through the world and exercising, going through what's called spiritual warfare. But in order to understand how to fight any battle when it comes to God, God says to us, to the Apostle Paul in the book of Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, I think by 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, it says, it says that the weapons, the weapons, the, 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 the battle weapons, the weapons that we use, the weapons of our warfare, when we're fighting battles, the weapon, weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. Today, we want to introduce the most powerful weapon that God has given the believer in all history and has run through every single page of the Bible. And it starts talking about this thing that is going to be introduced in verse 15. It says, listen, she says, this shall be, verse 14, when the Lord has given us the land that we're going to deal kindly 
and truly with you. When you deal kindly, that means they're going to show mercy. We're going to remember you. We're going to remember you if you remember what we tell you to remember. Uh, that's where I want to kind of start. I want to start. And, and, and what I want to do is, is to start off introducing right here that the, 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 verse, the verse in Hebrews, it says, it says, looking, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What we want to take from this verse for our sermon today is the key word. Number, the first word of that verse says looking. The word looking means to keep your, keep your focus. Keep focusing on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. And all through the scriptures, no matter what situation or what battle needed to be won, God has a way of introducing Jesus into all of it to make it so that the focus is not on how you're going to get out. The focus is on the tools that God gives that ensures that you will experience salvation, deliverance, victory, that you will conquer, that you will not. That Listen, it's not about what those spies are going to do or what the Israelite Joshua and his army is going to do. God gives them, God gives them a very clear way, gives, gives Rahab and her family a, a clear focal point. Here it is. It says, then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. So she lets them down through this cord, and she says to them, get to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, hide yourself three days in the pursuers until the pursuers return, and then you can go your way. And the men said to her, here we go, here we go. And the men say to her, we will be blameless of this, of your oath, which you have made us swear. In other words, it will not be, it will not be our fault if you don't do what we've discussed that you must do. What did they say that she must do? It says, behold, verse 18, verse 18, behold, when we come into the land, whenever we go into a situation where we get ready to fight a battle, when we come into the land, this is what God wants to see. You shall bind, you shall bind this line of scarlet thread, the scarlet thread. You shall bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which you did let us up down by. So they, Rahab let them down out of her house on a scarlet thread. The spies say the same scarlet thread that you let us down from your house on, take this scarlet thread and bind it, bind it in your window. It says, bind it to your window. Bind this line of thread in the window which you let us down by. The same window that you let us down by, put the thread in it and thou shalt bring your, bring your father and your mother and your brethren and all your father's household home unto you. Watch this, verse 19 says, and it shall be, it's, this is based on a promise. This is a covenant that's being established here. It's a covenant that's established and the covenant that's established is all focused on the scarlet thread. The scarlet thread. It said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. On the cross, he shed his blood. On the cross, he shed his blood. So when it says looking to Jesus, the first thing we have to do to really get understanding of what God is focusing on, what God wants Rahab to be a recipient of, even though Rahab may not be able to tie all this together, there are things that, that are in the, the redemptive plan of God that oftentimes we don't understand his ways. We don't understand God's thoughts. God's thoughts are past finding out. And as it pertains to Jesus dying on the cross, the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation that Jesus is the lamb, the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. So God, the God of eternity, in the eternal mind of God, God is not looking at what's going on so much with Rahab. God is letting Rahab know that if you want to be redeemed, if you want to be saved, if your family wants to be delivered, you've got to get your family connected to be able to be identified 
that they have their faith in the scarlet thread. The scarlet thread is a representative of the blood. And as we look backwards, we start looking backwards. As believers, as Christians, we have to look backwards. In the Old Testament, they look forward. Look backwards to what? We got to look back 2,000 years ago to see Jesus slain on the cross. Verse, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18, 19 says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. That's another way of God saying uh, it wasn't a ransom where somebody had to pay a million dollars to get you out of this situation that you were in. And the situation that you're in is God says that we were slaves to sin. Adam and Eve sinned. We were slaves to sin and we were in bondage to sin. The enemy is this is Satan is the enemy who has us in bondage. The world is what we live in and the world represents the mindset that's totally against God and the things of God and the mind of God and the world system is diabolically and diametrically opposed to God. They don't believe in God. They don't know God. They do not honor God. They dishonor themselves between themselves. They don't recognize God as God and they worship and they serve the creature more than they, re that they serve the creator. And God says, I didn't receive, I didn't redeem you with money because what I am going to, what, what's, what's been paid to redeem you out of sin and death and the, and the, and the, and the, and the threat, the danger of being delivered and being judged for sin and being, and, and dying in your sins and being dead because of our trespasses. When we sinned against God, the things we've done that have crossed over the line with God. Peter says, you weren't redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. It says, from your vain conversation received by traditions of your fathers. People are talking about all these things that you need to do in order for you to for, in order for you to get victory, in order for us to be able to be successful, in order for us to live a, 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 a successful life. But all that stuff is talking about the earthly. That's the, the stuff that is, 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 is temporary. God has his mind on eternity. He is more concerned about Rahab being able to put her object on the scarlet thread, which is what God is going to say that by her putting her faith and trust in the thread and not her faith and trust in Joshua and the army to come, if she puts her faith in the, in the scarlet thread, God says, if when I see the scarlet thread, I'm going to pass over your whole house. It's not going to be based on the battle that's going to go on in Jericho. It's not based on the things that are going on in this life, beloved. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world system that we live in, all the different situations and problems and the obstacles and the different injustice and the, and the racism and all those things are real. And I'm not saying that they're not real, but God wants us to not let ourselves get get caught up in thinking that our deliverance is going to come and that we're going to be redeemed because somebody gives us rights or that someone gives us a, 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 a gives us access or that we get a certain a part of the things that we are due because the money and the silver and the gold is not going to get us out of the biggest threat that we have as human beings. And the biggest threat is that we die and we spend eternity separated from God. God is focused on that. God has his mind on that. So he introduces to Rahab a very, very, it's a foolish, it's a foolish plan of salvation because God chooses the foolish things to just baffle and to confine, confound the minds of the people that think they know everything. But God has chosen one very, very simple thing and he's made it so that it's not silver and gold, but verse 19 in 1 Peter chapter 1 says, it's, but he didn't redeem us with silver and gold. He said, but look, but with the precious blood of Jesus as a lamb without blemish and without spot. This is the New Testament looking backwards to the cross. And then we go into this. This is where I want to kind of go to tie it all in together. Uh, I really feel like it's a good time because oftentimes I know that as believers and as, as people are involved in church, that we go through the rituals of church and we go through the different Things that are considered to be ordinances of church, uh, the two ordinances in the church that uh, the Bible, Jesus uh, initiated, the one ordinance is baptism that allows a person to be able to say, I identify with Jesus's death, 
his burial, and his resurrection. And when I go down in the water and I come up, I'm risen in new life in Christ. I have eternal life because I believe in the death that Jesus died on the cross. And because he died on the cross, I also believe that he was buried. And when he was buried, it represents that he was buried for me. I should have died for my sins. And because Jesus died for my sins, he endured the cross. He died a horrible death. He was judged. The Bible says, surely he has borne our griefs and he's carried our sorrows. And the Lord laid on him the evil acts of us all. And with his stripes, we are healed. When I believe that Jesus died for my sins, then we understand the whole introduction of the fact of the Lamb of God. A Lamb is what God has shown from Genesis all the way to Revelation. The Lamb is represents a substitutionary offering, someone who dies in our stead, someone or something that God has put in place where God kills it or judges it so he does not have to kill or judge me or kill and judge you. He bore our griefs. Jesus died for my sins. And when you can say that, that you know you've sinned against God and that we've all sinned and we've come short of the glory, the holiness and the righteousness of God and that the wages, what we're gonna earn for being sinners is death. It says, but the gift of God, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God shed his blood as a gift. God gave a gift to us. And all we gotta do, all we gotta do is receive him. As many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That's what God is really concerned about with Rahab. God is introduced in getting Rahab saved, exposing Rahab to the whole principle of the blood of Jesus through the symbolism of the, of the scarlet thread. And what we find is this. Here's how we get the amplification. In the New Testament, oftentimes the second ordinance, the first one is baptism. The second ordinance in the New Testament, as we look back, Jesus gives us some powerful instructions. In the night in which he was betrayed, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and some of us are familiar with these verses, and verse 25 and 26. These are verses that are read when churches practice the second commandment or ordinance that Jesus put in place. And this ordinance is called, we call it communion. It actually parallels an Old Testament practice that occurred in the book of Exodus. But this is what Jesus said, and I have it right here. I'm going to actually demonstrate as I take communion today so you can understand how you should be thinking about it when you take communion today or you take communion anytime. You can say, listen, it says, it says after the same manner, after Jesus had taken the bread and he broke it. He took the bread and he broke it. He said, this bread of this communion is my body. This is my body and symbolizes the fact that it was broken for you. Surely he was bruised for our transgressions. It says the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, his body being broken for us. It says we are healed. So we are healed from the penalty of death. We're, 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 we're healed from the, the degeneration, the fact that we are from death because the sting of sin is death. We're healed through his death and through his death because he had no sin. Now listen, listen. So the communion wafer is a wafer that is made from unleavened bread. The unleavened bread makes it so we have to see that Jesus Christ had no sin. He just didn't die but he was a, it was God in flesh. God came in the likeness of sinful flesh and died for our sins because God is holy. He has no sin. When he came in the person of Jesus, Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He died for us. And because he had no sin, when his body was broken for us and he died, death is the sting where there's no sin Death can't hold us. There's no sting. In other words, Jesus said, I got the power to lay my life down, to lay my life down, to be broken. I got the power to lay my life down. 
but I also have the power to take it up again. And that power is what he is saying, that if I believe in his death, I also will believe, I have to believe in his resurrection. If I believe in his resurrection, the resurrection is the assurance that God gives us that if we believe in the blood, if we keep our focus and we look to the blood, the blood that he shed ensures us that we don't have to shed our blood for our sins, but because he shed his blood, it's, it's, it's the assurance, it's the token. Rahab said, give me a token, give me a sign. Jesus said, this is the token, believers. Beloved, this is the token, from Genesis to Revelation, this is the token. This is always the, tar the token. This is the thread. It runs through from Genesis to Revelation. It goes through every page of the Bible. The thread that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, his body's going to be broken. It says broken for you as a substitute so God will not have to judge and break us. So we wouldn't have to be punished. So we would be spared from the penalty of the sins that we have committed against God. And then he says, this is, the, this is it, my body. Then he says, and after the same manner, what he did, he took the cup. He took the cup. He took the cup, which is a symbolization. It symbolizes the cup is of the vine. It comes, it symbolizes the vine of the grape of the vine, represents the life of Jesus, the blood. He says, this is the cup. He says, when he had supped, after he, after he took the communion, and he ate the communion, and he supped it. He said, now, as we're supping now, I'm going to teach you another thing. He said, now, 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 after the same manner, I'm going to take the cup. Look at the cup. He says, here's the cup. And when he had supped, he said, this is, this is a new testament. In other words, this is a new promise. This is a new covenant that I'm making with you. What he did with Rahab in the Old Testament, God established that Rahab would enter into covenant with him. Covenant through blood relationship, through blood covenant, through blood covenant, that Rahab would really, really consider the fact that in God's mind, the scarlet thread represented what he showed all the way from Genesis all the way to this point in time. And what we need to do is we need to run through it. He said, this is my, this is, this is the New Testament in my blood. Now listen to this. It says, this do you, do this. Do what? He says, as often as, as oft as you drink it, do what? Drink the blood, apply the blood. Look, don't just know the blood, apply the blood. The Bible says if we confess our sins, that means come into agreement with God that we have sinned, that God is faithful and just. Why? Because of the covenant that he's made with Jesus Christ. He's faithful. God will keep his promise and he's just. God can justify not sending us to hell, not causing us to die for our own sins because we put faith in the trust, our trust in the lamb who died for us. So God is faithful because he promised if you get the blood on the doorpost of your life, I will pass over you. God is faithful and he's just to what? To forgive. Here's where it's all coming together. He says, take the blood. He says, often as you drink it, every time you apply it, listen, don't just drink it. Don't, don't think about it like you're drinking, you're drinking it. No, he says, get it on the inside. Get the lamb on the inside. Get the blood working on the inside. Let the blood go into, put your faith in the blood. Put your whole trust in the blood. Trust the blood of Jesus, because the blood of Jesus never loses his power. It's the power in the blood. One day when I was lost, Jesus died on the cross, and I know it was the blood for me. So we look forward. As Christians, we look backwards. But in the Old Testament, people like Rahab and Adam and Eve, they look forward. God is saying everything is going to be focused on that one event. That one day, the, the most important day, the greatest day in all of the history of mankind is the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross and darkness went over the face of the earth from the, from the sixth to the ninth hour. And the Bible says that when Jesus took on the sin of the world, the sun stopped shining and the graves were opened up. And the Bible says that Jesus died. And when he took on sin for the world, the Bible says that Jesus said, it is finished. So God begins to teach the principle from Genesis to Revelation. Can we teach it just a little bit? Can I teach it just a little bit? Here it is, the scarlet thread. The scarlet thread is seen in the book of Genesis and chapter three. The scarlet thread is seen when in the animals that God killed in Eden to provide garments for Adam and Eve. When he did that, God took those skins. Where did the skins come from? God killed an animal instead of killing Adam and Eve for sinning. The Bible says that God told Adam, God told Adam, 
of all the trees in the garden, you can freely eat. He said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you should not eat it because in the day that you eat of it, you're going to surely, you're going to surely die. But we see in the account of the scripture that after God after Adam and Eve in the garden were beguiled by the serpent, they were convinced and Adam was convinced by his wife. His wife offered him to eat of the fruit. She ate it, then she offered it to him. And when Adam ate it, sin was passed on all men. And the Bible says that their eyes were open and then all of a sudden they realized that they were naked. They became sinners, unlike God. But what God did, he did not expect them to do what a lot of us think it's in. Adam and Eve decided because of their state, their condition, their eyes being open to their nakedness and their sinfulness and the fact that they were separated from God made it so they can't detect God. They can't hear God's voice. And what they tried to do, they tried to fix it themselves. When they tried to fix it themselves, they tried to put the focus on what they could do to save themselves. And they made for themselves coats of skins, coats of skins. No, they made, made for themselves. I'm sorry. I take it back. Listen, listen. They made for themselves fig leaves. They made for themselves fig leaves. They sewed these fig leaves together and covered themselves. God said, no, I will provide for myself a lamb. You can't fix this yourself because the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So what God did, he took an animal and killed the animal to allow us to see the first mention of the scarlet thread in the sacrifice of that animal. The bloody coats, the blood of the animals, the bloody coats covered Adam and Eve. That word cover is the, is the Hebrew word. It means kufar. It means to cover. It's the atonement, atonement, to cover. What did God do? God covered their sins from his eyes so that his holy eyes could not see their sin. All God saw was the blood, beloved. I know it was the blood. And then God goes further. And then what he does in the book of Genesis, he tells Abraham to offer up his son, Isaac, his promised son. God says, your only begotten, your beloved son, Isaac, take him to a mountain I'm going to show you. And I want you to offer your son up to me as a sacrifice. Abraham takes Isaac to Mount Moriah prepares him to offer him up as a sacrifice. And when Abraham rose up his knife to put it through his son's chest after he laid him on the altar to be offered up as a burnt offering, God speaks to Abraham and says, Abraham, Abraham, stay your hand. Don't put, don't go down with the knife. Do not kill your son. Then he goes into illustration. He says, because I have seen your faith without fear, you believe me and you believe what I told you. I told you, I promised you, Abraham, that you're going to have a land that I promised and I promised you a seed. Your son is the promised seed. And I told you that because of that seed, that all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. Abraham considers what God says, remembers is the promise of God. Abraham stands on the promise of God. And Abraham says, listen, first of all, God gave me my son out of a dead woman's wound, a 99 year old woman. My wife, Sarah, had this baby, baby by miracle. So the miracle baby is was born by the miraculous, powerful God that's able to do everything and anything. The almighty God caused me to have a son. And if God promised that all the world, all the nations in the world will be blessed through this seed, my seed, then God going to keep his promise. And I believe God, first of all, if I kill Abraham, if I kill Isaac, God going to raise him from the dead because he told me that his, my son going to live. So Abraham said, by faith, I'm going to kill this boy. And God said, because I have seen your faith, Abraham, because I see that you recognize what I'm going to do. I'm going to continue with the scarlet thread. The Bible says that Abraham looked and all of a sudden he heard a ram that was stuck in the thickets. And God said, ha, ah. Abraham was so excited. He said that God has supplied for himself a lamb. I didn't have to give my son. God's never going to require me to try to save myself or to sacrifice my children or to sacrifice. When I sacrifice 
all that I have and put faith in salvation and redemption through the blood of Jesus, God says, your faith has saved you. Abraham, your faith saved you. And now all of us that believe God like Abraham did, we're called sons of Abraham because without faith, it's impossible to please God. The first thing we must do like Rahab, we must believe that God is Abraham. So we know who it is. We know the deal. We know all we know. We, we know what was going on. We know these people, uh, what God did to, to Sihon and to, and to Og. We know what God did to them. We saw how God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. We, Abraham, uh, look, Rahab had her focus and faith on God. And because her faith was in God, God said, now let me show you the scarlet thread, Rahab. Let me show you that, that the only way the redemption would be done by me, you got to come through this thing through the blood. Hallelujah. You got to learn how to put that. You got to apply the blood. The second, the look, that, that's the... So Abraham, the Bible says that Abraham recognized the ram and the ram took Isaac's place as a substitute and God called God Jehovah Jireh. God will supply. God will see to it. God will supply all my needs. God is the one who will supply. God will, God will bring it to pass. God's going to cause all this to happen, beloved. All we got to do is look to Jesus, the author and the finisher. He started this faith journey in Genesis and he's going to finish it when we recognize and we see how the book of Revelation ends. Now, I want to go one more thing, one more thing to amplify before we close out for the day. And we'll pick it up again next week. But I want to close it out for the day by saying this. Watch, 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 watch. So, so what we did is we said, okay, okay. So we took the communion and we took the blood. Let's, let's, ampl let's amplify the blood. Come on, put it on your, post it in your comments. The blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. I believe that what we've done, we've fallen away from understanding the significance and the power of the blood of Jesus. And now this has become like a sweet song. It's like singing your favorite song. I know it was the blood. But do you really, really, do you really apply the blood? Do you really apply the blood? When you sin against God, do you plead the blood? Do you plead the blood? Do you plead the blood? You got to learn how to plead the blood over your situation. You got to do like they did. God demonstrated this very thing. When you're in a situation where you realize that there's a plague coming through and the death angel has been loosed like it was in the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus allows us to see a very, very vivid illustration of the scarlet thread that we must really understand in order for us to understand how to walk in the power and the victory that's in the blood of Jesus. We got to see what the blood does when you apply the blood over your doorpost. The Bible says that God told Pharaoh, let my people go. He told Satan, let my people go. He told the enemy, let my people go. God is in control. Nobody's going to hold us hostage. Nobody, we're not going to be victims. We're going to be victors because our victory is in our faith in God and the blood and the, and look, and the scarlet thread that God has given us that's supposed to be applied to every situation in your life. You got children that act like they're crazy, plead the blood over your doorpost. The Bible says God told God told Moses, this is what you got to do. You got to know how the scarlet thread works. He said, I need you to take a lamb, a lamb, a lamb without spot blemish, representing the sinless life of Jesus. He said, I need every house, every house, a lamb for every house. Every house got to have a lamb. That means every nation, every house in, in the world, every home, every family, all families, all the world, all the world, because God does, that, does not desire that anybody should perish, but that God so loved the world. Every house got to have a lamb. Do you have a lamb? Do you have, have you really by faith decided that you're going to accept what John the Baptist, as we look backwards to the cross, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming up and he said, behold the lamb of God, who what? Takes away the sin of the world. So what's happening in Exodus? God calls this very act, the very same thing that we're practicing when we take communion. God is showing us communion. He's showing us the Passover. But the Bible says in the New Testament that Jesus is our Passover lamb. What does the Passover teach us? God says, take the lamb. And he says, first of all, I want you to take it and burn it up, cut it up, put it on the altar and burn it up, burn it up, burn it up, and then eat all of it. That means you got, listen, you can't just accept some of Jesus. You can't believe some of the things. The most important thing that Paul amplified, he says, look, I don't know nothing among you. We could, we could argue about our theology. We could argue about our doctrine. We could argue about whether you believe this, you don't believe that. Paul said all that is uh, all that is insignificant because the real thing is all about the scarlet thread. 
Paul said, I don't care about it. All I know, I don't know nothing among any of you besides Christ and him crucified. And if we keep our focus on the cross, we won't fear what men can do to us. If we keep our focus on the blood, this is what the blood does. He says, then I want you to do is eat all of it. If you got too much lamb, give them to give some lamb to your neighbor. Share it, share, evangelize, share your faith, share the lamb. Don't be stingy with your lamb. Give the lamb, share the lamb with others so that they can be protected, so they can experience deliverance, so they can experience atonement. What does it mean? He gives an illustration. He says, this is what I want you to do. Take the blood, take the blood, take the blood. When you, when you butcher this lamb, I want you to catch that blood in a basin and take the blood and get yourself something and slap. Sop that blood all over the doorpost. Get the blood over the lintel. Get the blood over the place. And then God says, and when I see the blood, oh, I'll pass over. When I see the blood, hey, uh, Rahab, listen, this is, the, this is the token. You said you want a token? The token is not just, I'm going to give you a promise. We're going to remember you. We're going to, when we come through, we won't kill your family. God says, no, 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 no. We need a better, we need a more powerful token than that. Rahab, the focus is not in what they say they're going to do for you. The token is what I say that I'm going to do because I'm, I am Jehovah Nissi. I'm the one that fights the battle for you. I am the Lord, your salvation. I'm your savior. I am the one, the only one that can deliver you from the hand of the enemy. And Rahab, I'm not just focusing on you getting saved. I want you to do this. I need you to get your whole family up under the blood. Get your father under the blood. Get your mother under the blood. Get your sisters. Get all the children, your whole family under the blood. Come on, beloved. Remember that Bible verse when Peter was there and the Bible says that that Peter was in prison and the angel of the Lord, and, they, and Peter was in prison and the angel of the Lord uh, uh, came, it, 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 and, and uh, no, no, they were in prison and all of a sudden, the uh, yeah, the, the angel of the Lord appeared while, while Peter was in prison. And the doors of the prison opened up and God miraculously was delivering Peter. And the people, it was either Peter or Paul, uh, don't correct me on this, but it's one of those two. But the bottom line is the story. What happened is the doors were open and the prison guards were so concerned about what the king was going to do to them, be, do to them because they escaped. They said, they said, look, we're going to, they're about to, they're about to kill themselves. They're about to commit suicide because they knew they were going to, their heads were going to be cut off for this. The apostle said, wait, do you, don't do no harm to yourself. You believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your house. Up, oh, there's the scarlet thread. Believing, putting faith. In the Lord Jesus Christ and the blood, you got to get the blood covering the doorposts of your life. You got to get, look, you got to get the blood covering the sins. Hey, Rahab, I know you will harlot, but if you put your faith in the scarlet thread, the scarlet redeems the harlot. Ooh, the scarlet redeems the harlot. It didn't matter though your sins be as scarlet, Rahab. God said, I wash them whiter than snow. And God was more concerned about reconciliation with Rahab, redemption, being Rahab being reunited with God. And the power of this is it says, look, it says, and look, and, and, it, and it shall be, verse 19 of Joshua chapter two, it shall be that whosoever goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood should be upon his own heads. In other words, if you don't, if they don't put their faith in the scarlet thread and they go out and act like they didn't hear what we what was said, what God said, his blood's gonna be upon his own head. And we will be guiltless. That's why when Jesus told the disciples to go out two by two and then share this gospel and preach the gospel of the kingdom, house to house. And it says they don't receive you. He says, shake the dust off your feet. Shake the dust off your feet. Because the blood of the individual that rejects the Lord Jesus, the blood is gonna be on their own head. And we're going to be guiltless. But we don't want to be found guilty of not sharing our great commission. He said, go ye, therefore. He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye, Jesus said. Teach all nations. Baptize them. Hallelujah. 
In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all these things. With So the observation, Jesus said, of all the things that I want you to do as I prepare myself to be offered up on this cross, they say that the final words that a person utters before they die are some of the most important words that they could ever say. And on the night before Jesus was betrayed, the night of his betrayal, he gave us these words. He said, take it. Get, you, get yourself a lamb. I am the lamb. Take me. Possess me. Make sure that I am your shepherd. Make it personal. You take it and you eat it. Get the lamb on the inside of you because Christ in you is the hope of deliverance, victory, and salvation. He says, and then after that, he said, after that, he says, take the cup of the blood, apply the blood, get under the blood, beloved. If you're not under the blood and you leave the word of God that is going forth, that you've heard, the gospel of your salvation, if you don't believe it, your blood will be on your own hands. And God is saying today that it is, listen, this is not just an Old Testament story. The thread runs all the way through the whole entire Bible. Every single page of the Bible bleeds the blood of Jesus. So what I wanna to say today, that as we pause and we allow ourselves to process First thing we need to do is we need to just recap a little bit. And we need to look backwards. We're looking back. We're looking back. And we realize that we gotta look to Jesus. He's the one that, that he's the author. He's the one that wrote this whole redemption plan. We gotta look to Jesus. Stop looking anywhere and everywhere else apart from Jesus. The object of our faith, I always teach this, that faith has to have an object. And the object of our faith is God. We must say that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Well, I please God when I believe that God is. And because I believe that God is, what God says, that settles it. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It says, and this is the record. This is the recorded account of what God has given us. He's given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He says that there is no other name that is written in heaven and on earth. But at the name whereby man must be saved. No other name that is given whereby man must be saved. But at the name of Jesus. Every, every name. I don't care the ones that are dead. The, the sea and the, the graves are going to give up. The, the dead will be risen. Everyone that has lived a life since God created man, all souls are going to give account. But it says every knee going to bow, whether you believe it or whether you don't. You're going to believe it, and then every knee is going, every tongue, every tongue, whatever tongue you speak, whatever language you speak it in, Every single tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And because God has given us this record, he's given us eternal life. That life is in his son. He that has the son has life. And the life of the body is in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, no forgiveness, no reconciliation, no deliverance, and no eternal life. So with all eyes closed, we thank the Lord for today. We thank the Lord for this time that we've been able to really focus on the scarlet thread. And God, we pray right now. Did you touch the heart of somebody that will hear this word? And God, we pray that after they hear, the gospel of their salvation. And after they believe, 
that they will be sealed with the Holy Ghost of promise until the redemption of the purchased possession. Do you believe we will, we never ever want to close out without extending an opportunity someone, for someone to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. And as we pray, I ask that you pray with me. We pray this prayer. We say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And Lord, I believe that you shed your blood to wash, to cleanse, and to cover my sins. Lord, forgive me for my sins. Save me. I repent. And I ask you to come into my life and to be my Lord and Savior. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. And for his name you say. Hallelujah. God bless you. If you if you receive that, hallelujah. If you really, really, really believe that, could you just post the amen and give God the praise and the glory? We thank the Lord for what our ears have heard and what our hearts are feeling even right now. As we continue our journey through the book of Joshua, we pray that you do one thing today, that you take the blood and apply it to your life. He says, we confess, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, he says, and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That's the power of the blood. That's why the blood never loses its power. The blood is, the blood should always be right on the forefront of your mind. You should be looking and always understanding the significance of the blood. When you sin against God, when I sin against God, when we sin against God, we should instantaneously plead the blood and ask God to forgive us and to plead the blood over our lives and say, God, forgive me. I plead the blood of Jesus. Wash me in your blood. And the Bible says, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. Do you, I need to be cleansed. We all need to be cleansed. There's no one that can say that in the course of any day that you don't need to be cleansed. Well, beloved, I know I'm saved, but every day I need to get my, my sins washed. I do things in thought and word and deed. The sin against God, that's what the blood is for. That I can make sure that there's nothing between my soul and my Savior. So with that, we want to say thank you so much for fellowshipping with us. We pray and ask that you would consider liking this message on your Facebook Live page. We also would ask, we ask seriously, that you would consider sharing this message with your Facebook friends so that we can get the word out, that we can get it to go across to all nations. We thank the Lord for the testimonies that we're getting that represent how far the word is going and the individuals that God is reaching. We're not doing this for anything besides that, that God get the glory and that some man, some woman, and some boy or some girl can be saved and experience the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. So we ask your prayer for support. We pray that you would consider, amen, praying for our ministry, amen, praying for our ministry, and we're preparing ourselves for the new, the new the launching of our church as we start all over again. And we pray that you will consider being a part of our ministry. Amen. And if you are interested, amen, just put a post on there and say, I'm in, I'm in, hallelujah, I'm interested. And we'll continue getting the website ready so we can begin to correspond and to begin to advertise and market and promote the church as Sanctuary is moving forward. With that being said, may God bless you real good. And remember, I know it was the blood for me. God bless you so much. Walk with the king today and be a blessing. We'll see you later, again on next Sunday. Remember to join us every Tuesday night as we're posting on our Facebook page, the Zoom link for Zoom Bible study every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. with Pastor Anthony Lester. God bless you. Amen.